I love people that know the word and walk the word, just not talk it. And Caleb does this. So I just want to welcome Caleb, Caleb up. And you're going to be so blessed by the teaching gift on Caleb. So just draw from him this morning. Just receive this morning. Yep. Praise God. So it's good to be in the house of God. Amen. You part of the greatest story ever told? It's not loud enough. Are you part of the greatest story ever told? Yes. Amen. That's great. So, um, see, I, came for, I come from a church that's always, you know, always shouting, and I like that. So, I know that we like that. So, feel free to shout. Feel free to stand up, dance around, whatever. Um, it actually will help me and help you. Uh, so, let's, let's get involved in the Word of God. And today, I was going to talk about the greatest story ever told within the greatest story ever told, all right? That's a double whammy there, so we're going to go for it. Um, so before I do that, we're just going to read through the text that we're going to go through today, uh, and it's in Mark chapter 4, verse 3 to 9. I realize it's a bit small, so read it out. Um, and uh, this is the same story that you find in Matthew as well, but we're going to go with the Mark version for now. So I'm reading from verse 3 onwards. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit, that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some hundred. And he said unto them, He that has ears, let him hear. How many of us have ears? Yes. Amen? Good, we're going to hear. So, um, I'm going to go through three parts. We're going to try and run through the first two, uh, because the third part is what I really want to get to tonight. But we're going to talk about the evidence for the Word of God, right? And then we're going to talk about the endurance of the Word of God. And then we'll finally talk about how to exercise the Word of God. All right? So, let's talk through the evidence. Um, so, there's, the Bible is very unique compared to all other religious books across the world. All right? I come from India, a land of 33 million deities. All right? 33 million gods. I, that's I, I don't know how they even pray to those many. I, I said, if you give me, you know, a pound each, I have 33 million pounds, but I'm still waiting on that. But anyway, so the Bible has 40 different authors, okay? Spans 1,500 years, written over three continents, and has 66,000 manuscript copies. So what I kind of want to go through is, why is it important that the Bible should have so many copies, all right? So many manuscript copies. If I'm in this room and I start to dictate something to y'all, I see a lot of you taking notes. So if I start saying something, all right, and one of you gets it wrong, okay, writes the wrong note down, the best way I can then find out if, if what I, someone who's coming in can find out what I said is to look at all of them and then see who's wrong and then they know the exact answer, all right? So the Bible has lots of that evidence. Uh, but the next thing that we really want to see is also... Um, what is the time difference between the start, the first time the Bible was written, and the copies we actually have today, all right? So how much time has passed? Because if too much time has passed, there's a chance that it could perhaps have been changed, you know? Um, finally, the third thing is how much has changed over that time period, all right? That's very important. And, um, you know, you watch these movies and, you know, everyone says, oh, you know, the Bible's been changed over time. I'm here to tell you that is fake news, all right? The Bible has not been changed over time. You'll see that in the Old Testament, actually. Um, the Old Testament, so we had these, these, these scrolls from the Old Testament from 900 AD. That was the earliest we had, all right? And so we looked through them, and it's about 900 AD, you know, years after the Old Testament, the originals were written. And then... Somewhere along the last 200 years or so, probably more, I'm probably going to get the dates wrong on this, but we found scrolls from 150 BC of the entire Old Testament. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Great scrolls, all right? Pastor Brian's probably spoken about this at some stage, but what's amazing about those is what you want to then do is put them side by side and compare them, 
all right? And when they were compared, what was found was that it was 95% exactly the same word for word. That is amazing. That's a thousand year difference with no changes. So what's the 5%? I don't want to give up the 5%, you know? Uh, so the 5% is actually spelling mistakes and slips of the pen. So can you believe that? That is the accuracy with which the word of God has been preserved. But it gets even more stunning when you go to the New Testament. So what you see there is actually, um, it's a timeline. So if, i um, just going to get the pen up here. So yeah, so if that is the start, all right, of the New Testament, all right, when it was first written, this is how much time it took for the first copies that we have today, all right? So the copies written within this timeline we have today. We compare that with other books in history, okay? So, for example, how many of you have heard of Julius Caesar? Julius Caesar, all right, yeah, British education system still doing its job. People know about Julius Caesar, that's good. And so, Julius Caesar, for him, we have a difference of approximately 950 years before the first copy and what we have today. So that's 950 years. What's it for the Bible? Right? I went down with one of my friends, actually, Peter. We went down to the Chester Beatty Museum in Dublin and we saw the oldest copy of the book of Mark, which is believed to be from 130 AD. That's within, within less than 100 years of it originally being written. All right? That is how amazing we actually have copies dating back to 130 AD. That's how stunning God has preserved his word. But what's more important is to see the number of copies, like I said before. Uh, for Julius Caesar, right, it's about nine to ten copies, all right? Julius Caesar, nine to ten copies. Let's, let's go about the Bible. I get excited about this one. There's 5,000 Greek copies alone of the New Testament, 10,000 Latin copies, and 9,300 others. That is approximately 25,000 copies of the Word of God, right? Nothing comes close to that. I was actually um, listening to um, Dan Wallace, who's an American professor of New Testament studies, and he said that if you take the average Greek writer and you know all the copies we have their works and we stack them up, it comes to about four feet. And um, I've just guessed I'm five seven, but approximately that, right? That's how much we have. But if you actually put the copies over one after the other on, on top of the other for the New Testament, it reaches a mile high. A mile high, all right? And if you do the Old Testament on top of that, that's 2.5 miles high. There's nothing, nothing. The Bible is the most scrutinized book in the history of humanity. And if you look back, it's 99.5% pure, according to historians, secular historians, not Christians, not all of us crazies in church, people out there, 99.5% pure. Isn't that absolutely stunning? So the Word of God has endured a lot, right? You're going to see these three very funny-looking men on the screen. Um, that's John Wycliffe. Um, John Wycliffe was a Bible translator um, in the early, um, early mid-1300s or so. And um, he tried to translate the Bible into the common language, which is English. And uh, he got into trouble for it because nobody wanted the Bible translated. You know, the church was very powerful at the time, and they were the only ones who had the word of God, so they didn't want him to translate the word. So what did they do? They ended up um, stopping him, putting him on trial, and he escaped with his life only because he was friends with the king's son, or else he was going to be killed, right, for translating the Bible into English, okay? What happens then? John Wycliffe dies. Forty years after his death, the church is so angry that he's tried to translate the word, that they remove his bones, burn them, and throw them into the river. Right? That's how much they hated that. All right? So along comes this man with a nice cap called John Huss. All right? John Huss was Bohemian. He was from Bohemia. Um, don't ask me where that is on the map. I don't know. But he tried to translate the Bible into his local language, and he was burnt alive as fun at a carnival for trying to translate the Bible. In fact, they were so excited they were burning him alive. History says that the Pope fell off his chariot in excitement into a snowdrift, right? Can you believe that for trying to translate the Bible, you know? Um, but finally, you've got this man, William Tyndale, and he is my favorite because William Tyndale was a guy who spoke straight, all right? He told you the fact, and I like that. You know, I like to tell you the fact. 
right? And so William Tyndale, uh, one day God told him, you're going to translate the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And, uh, you know, his, um, he was sitting at a dinner with a few learned friends, and, and learned friend said to him, he said, you know, it's God's law. God has put his law on my heart that I should translate the Bible. And his friend said, it is better to be without God's law than the Pope's. So he actually said, the Pope's law is more important than, the God, than God's law. So the Pope says, don't translate, don't translate. But William Tyndale turned around and he said, if God spares my life, not many years from now, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. All right, that was the sort of man he was, all right? And he had to flee England. He had to go over to the continent, go to Germany, because Martin Luther had already translated the Bible, and there's a reformation. He was, he was chased even there, and he finally managed to escape here and there, but eventually he was betrayed by one of his closest friends and ended up being caught, being strangled, and being burnt alive. He was the only person to have ever translated the entire Bible. All right, the first man. And his Bibles were contraband in England. They were like drugs. You weren't allowed to have them. Anyone who possessed a Bible by William Tyndale would be burnt alive. That's how bad it was. But this is, this is, that's not all. You know, Samson, when he died, he killed more Philistines in his death than when he was alive. So let's see what William Tyndale did. When William Tyndale was about to die, he said, his last dying prayer was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Within four years, four English translations of the Bible were published in England at the king's behest, including Henry's official great Bible. All were based on William Tyndale's work. Isn't that just amazing? Right? Isn't that? His dying prayer was answered. But... It doesn't stop there. Even till today, in 1993, uh, a guy called Edmund Fabian was murdered in Papua New Guinea for translating the Bible. In March 2016, four Bible translators working for an American Evangelical Association were murdered in the Middle East. This is March 2016. This is not long back. Many people in China only got their Bibles at the turn of the, of the decade. You know, And I actually have a video for you to watch. Um, please watch it. Uh, and I, I want you to just think, do we really love the Word of God as much as these people do. So I'm just going to put that on next here. And that absolutely stunning. Sorry, I was going to use my bottle to speak, but hey. Uh, isn't that absolutely stunning how much they love the Word of God? All right, so we've looked, yeah, so we've looked at the evidence for the Word of God. We've looked at the endurance of the Word of God. But the most important thing is how do you exercise the Word of God in your daily life, all right? And this is where we go back to that passage, right? So I'm not going, I'm not going to read every verse, okay? I'm going to have the verses up on the screen. If you take notes, take them down, read them on. If you can, read them behind me. Feel free to look into them. But I'm going to just read the verses that I want to pick out from that passage. Um, so, why is that passage so important? Why is the parable of the sower so important? Jesus actually said, if you don't understand this passage, you don't understand any other passage. So this is the greatest story in the greatest story ever told. Okay? And not fun. The greatest story in the greatest story ever told. So, I want you to notice two things, all right? First is, how do you apply it? Okay? Second is, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in applying it? Okay? Because the Word and the Spirit, the Word and the Spirit. Okay, if you have too much of the Word, you dry up. If you have too much of the Spirit, you blow up. If you have the Word and the Spirit, you grow up. All right? Amen? That's plagiarized. That wasn't me, but I'll tell you who said it. Uh, so, we're just going to, I'm just going to go through and tell you. So, it begins, the passage begins with 
The sower sows the word. All right, Jesus is explaining this passage now. We've moved on from Mark 3. We've come down to Mark 14. And Jesus is explaining the passage. And the first thing he says is the sower sows the word. So what is the seed? Is the? What's the seed? Word of God. Come on. Holler. Um, but, so what I'm going to do is we've been learning about healing for a while. So I'm going to apply this healing scripture, okay, and we're going to see how to apply this healing scripture in our lives through this passage, all right? So the, let's take this healing scripture as seed, okay? Let's take it as seed. I'm going to read it out to you. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses, all right? So, do you know that famous verse, by his stripes we were healed? Yeah? That famous verse we all use all the time, right? So, you're going to see how to use that, okay? Uh, it occurs three times in the, in the Bible, once in the Old Testament, once when Jesus was speaking it, and once in Peter, all right? So, three times, so I always say past, present, future. The word remains the same, all right? Amen? So, the word is incorruptible seed, okay? There is nothing wrong with this Bible. We've seen how cool it is, how it's not changed. This word will never change, okay? So the seed is always good, right? The word you put in you is always going to work. So what's different then? Jesus talks about four kinds of earth, four kinds of soil, all right? And the four kinds of soil determine how the seed will grow, okay? Some people say it's four different people, four different types of people, yes. Or what I like to say is it's four stages of getting to the end point, okay? All of us are in one of these four categories, okay? And we're going to see the four categories. So we're going to apply this healing seed. The first one, okay, is it talks about um, the seed that fell by the wayside, okay? And the seed that fell by the wayside, what's really interesting about it is that it's the only seed that the devil had access to, all right? Four types of soil, only one soil the devil has access to. Jesus explains and he says, the seed that was fallen by the wayside, okay, the devil came and he took it away so that it would not work, okay? This is the only ground that the devil has access to. And we're going to see, Matthew actually puts it better than Mark when he explains it and he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches the way which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. If you don't understand what is being preached, all right, the devil's going to come and take it away. Okay? So we're going to try and keep it simple so you understand what is being preached. I like that about our church is that we're always trying to keep the word simple. It's very important to do that. Another thing is use the translation that you understand, please. I use King James because I was born and raised King James, right? So, <laughs> so I use King James. I pray King James. That's just me. It's not for everyone. You know, some people use the new King James. Some people use the NLT. Use a translation that you can actually grasp and understand. If you don't understand it, there's no point, okay? Um, you know, I was just reading, some people talk about eschatology and etymology and ecclesiology and pneumatology and ophthalmology. Sorry, that's eye doctors, ophthalmology is not. But that's all the various kinds of theology you can study, all right? But the problem with that is, oftentimes they don't really understand the word, okay? It's just hearsay. It's just chat, 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 chat. There is no word in it. There is no understanding of the word in it, okay? So we're going to try and use an easy translation. But that is actually true depth, you know? A lot of people, they come to church and they hear these big words on a Sunday and they'll be like, oh my goodness me, you know, uh, the word was really deep today. You know, it's not. It didn't get in you. It didn't get in you. So it's, it's practically not deep at all. But Smith Wigglesworth, who was a man used by God very mightily, said, some people read their Bible in Greek, and some people read their Bible in Hebrew, but I read mine in the Holy Spirit. Amen? If you read your Bible in the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, you will understand the word. I guarantee you that, all right? You will understand the word. So, how do you apply that to healing seed, all right? First of all, that seed that we saw, all right, in the previous slide, we saw the, the word, okay, that seed very clearly there is talking about physical healing. So number one, we understand that it's talking about physical healing. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's only spiritual healing. It's only up there. It's emotional healing. No, it's very clear 
it was talking about physical healing. How do I know that? Jesus said it. Okay? How do you know something? Jesus said it. Then the second thing is, okay, it's talking about your spirit. Okay, how do I know that? Well, when you're saved, okay, it's the same kind of thing that happens, okay? It's that verse it comes in the context of salvation as well. What happens when you were saved? Did anyone grow new hair? Did any gray hair turn black? Did anyone grow their teeth back? You looked the same, right? You felt the same. It was all the same. So what changed? Your spirit changed. And as your spirit changes on the inside, slowly it starts leaking out into the outside. So when it says, by his stripes you were healed, you are healed. All right? There's some people who think by ignoring their, their problem, they're, they're being faithful, you know? So you go, I'm healed. And then you've got like a massive goiter on your neck and you're going, I'm healed. Have you, got, have you got a goiter on your neck? No, no, no. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Or some people go, by his stripes I was healed. By his stripes I was healed. And they're hoping that by saying that over and over again, they're going to get healed. That is not the reality. You're saying that because you are already healed. That is the reality. Your spirit is more real than your natural. Does that make sense? All right? Have we understood that, right? So that's the first bit. But the next one then, so first point was understand the word. Second point was meditate on the word. Now I'm going to read uh, Mark 4, 16, 17. It says, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves. And so endure but for some time. But afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So, this is something that, again, is very, very important. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to grow that word deep in your heart, deep in your spirit. It has to mix with your spirit. It has to go in, right? It can't just be here. Okay, it can't just be here, it can't just be here, it can't just be here, it has to go all the way down here. All right, and who can do that? Only the Holy Spirit. You and I can't do that, okay? So that's very, very important. And so you got to, for that to happen, all right, it has to be there long enough, okay? It has to be there long enough. If you don't meditate on the Word of God long enough, it is never going to go deep enough, okay? I just said something very nice. If you don't meditate on the word of God long enough, it won't go deep enough. Okay? So you need to meditate on the word of God long enough so it goes deep enough in your life. I've said that three times, okay? So, um, it's very, very important to meditate on the word of God, you know? And, and, and then what happens when you start meditating on the word of God is you start getting persecuted for that word. Okay? That word that I just brought up, okay, we're going to apply that again, okay, we're going to go back there and we're going to talk about it again. When I say by his stripes you are healed, the devil will come and say, no, that's just, that's just spiritual healing. No, that's just, that's just in your mind. Oh, look, look, look at that pain. No, 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 it can't be true. And you'll find that people will come and put a label on you. They'll stick a label on you. Prosperity. He's a prosperity person. He is a word of faith person. He is a do this and do that person. He is a try to work for yourself person. And they'll come and stick a label on your head and you'll take that label, all right? And the problem with that is, that is going to be the persecution that comes. But if you have not meditated on the word long enough and deep enough, that persecution, all right, is going to make the word wither away. Okay, people come all the time and they say, well, you know, he prayed and he wasn't healed. Why should I believe? Right? Why should I do that? I always tell people, don't bring your story and come to me. Take my testimony and go to God. All right? Don't bring your story and come to me. Take my testimony and go to God. If God could do it for one person, he can do it for every single person. And you know why? God does not respect people. All right, he respects his word. If you apply his word, it will work. All right, it will always work, 100%. There is not a chance. Like I said before, the seed is incorruptible. If it worked in my life, it'll work in your life. You know, um, 
you don't need to you don't need to answer every argument you know you don't need to give a, a response to everything every time i'm like that sometimes i like to go and tell people you know this i know this this is why this is why you know you don't need to you honestly don't need to as long as you're meditating on the word of god you don't need to oftentimes the reason you're trying to do that is because you don't really believe it so you're trying to get rid of your own doubt by arguing with other people and that's not going to end well i know a lot of people who've had all sorts of problems some people i know have actually had mental illness come on them because they've tried to defend something that they don't believe themselves all right because it is true why would you defend something you don't believe that's a bit you know that's not normal um but you know i i, I remember the 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 joke and we used to hear of um was you know there's a sunday school teacher and she was teaching the kids about jonah and she said uh you know jonah the whale the whale could not have swallowed jonah because the throat of a whale is so tiny a man can't fit through and the sunday school girl there who turned around at the teacher and she said no he went into the belly of a whale and the teacher said no that's not possible that's a mistake she said no he went into the belly of a whale and this went on for some time and finally um the girl got frustrated and she told the teacher when i get to heaven i will ask jonah and the teacher looks at the girl and she's trying to be smart you know and she says what if jonah's in hell and the girl looks at her and she says well then you ask him <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so y- you know you don't need to let other people's experience mess up your vision other people's opinions come in and choke come in and and dry the word up don't let that persecution come in right so the final thing is the final type of soil that it didn't work in was a soil that where there was lots of thorns okay and this is very important i found myself going through part 1 part 2 quite easily all right i remember when i wasn't feeling too well recently i called tony and she sent me this lovely healing scriptures you know 100 healing scriptures 101 healing scriptures by kenneth copeland and i played it on all day and all night and all day and all night and you know and i meditated on it and i just stood on it and you know nothing was moving me and then let's read the verse it says and these are they which are sown among thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful seed takes time to grow all right is there any farmer in the house anyone who's ever planted a tree from a seed i have really no one no one's planted a seed right homework go plant a seed <laughs> all right go plant a seed when you plant a seed all right you can't dig it up to see whether it's growing every day i have never planted a seed today and got a fruit tomorrow it does not work that way why because if your seed if you plant it today and it grows tomorrow one either the soil is not thick enough the seed is not good enough or else you've just bought artificial seed If you want real seed that lasts and stays and grows and becomes big and becomes a mighty tree, you know Jesus talks about the mustard tree it goes from a seed to being a tree, right? If you want that in your life, you have to let it grow. You have to take time, okay? So a lot of people like me put an end date on it. We go 10th of October 2359 I will be healed. All right, I'm just using that. It's, it's nothing special about that date, but I go like that, you know? this state and you know what the devil does the devil knows that you're just going to keep your faith till the 10th of october 2359 so what's he going to do he's going to go till the 11th of october 0002 that's what he's going to go to he's going to go 2 minutes past midnight why so that you will lose your faith in the, that that 2 minute slot don't put a date on it as long as it takes for that thing to come out of your spirit into your flesh keep going keep going keep going we chat about this we don't stop all right we keep going and that's so important there's only two times in the word um that i've come across you know if you come across more come up we'll, we'll chat about it. but two times jesus says such great faith i have not seen all right one is the centurion all right and there was a centurion who came to jesus and you know his child his his servant was sick and he wanted jesus to heal him and so he comes up to jesus and he goes uh, you know will you pray will you will you come he sends a servant and he says will you come on my roof and you know and then on the way sends another servant and he says i am not worthy that you come under my roof 
speak the word only, and my servant will be made well. What was he doing? He was allowing Jesus to plant the seed, and he was not going to wait for thunder and lightning. You know, it's all very good for us to fall down in the middle of a service, to have the Holy Spirit come upon us, to have all of that. I believe in all of that. Okay, I'm a crazy Pentecostal. I believe in all that madness. But, all right, but, a lot of us, the issue with us is we're looking to that to confirm the word. That is the sign of a not very mature believer. Some people are not going to like that. That is the sign of a not very mature believer. Because the word was confirmed by signs and wonders the first time Paul preached in a new place. Or when anyone preached. You know, God confirmed the word, signs and wonders. He still does today. Right? But if you're only looking for the signs and wonders, that's not a very good indication. So the soldier said, speak the word only and my son will be healed. That was when Jesus said, that is great faith. He understood this parable. Right? Next person was a Syrophoenician woman. She had a daughter who was sick. She came to Jesus. Whatever way it went, you know, I've struggled over that. And I've, finally the Lord showed me what it was. But Jesus calls her a dog. <laughs> Can you believe that? Jesus called her a dog. I'm just like, oh, no, no. That's that. No. But anyway, God explained that to me. We'll have another sermon for that someday. But she says, even little dogs eat what crumbs fall from the master's table. She did not care what anybody around her said, did, who she was, nothing. She came to Jesus and she was like, I'm going to get my miracle and only then I'm going to leave. She didn't let anything distract her. All right? In the Bible, the word dog, they used to use for certain people who came from certain places, right? We all have that somewhere. We don't say it much nowadays, but most people have that in their heart, you know? Oh, it's just from there. You know, she's just, from, she's just from that place there. That's what was happening, all right? But she didn't let that distract her. She didn't let the cares of this world distract her from her eternal goal. That was healing for her daughter. And what happened? She got it. She got it. So in India, we used to say, you know, again, applying that to this, we used to say, busy means being under Satan's yoke. All right? A lot of people are busy. A lot of people are busy all the time, you know, and the devil will, if the devil can't slip in doubt when you're looking, okay, the devil will slip in doubt when you're not looking, okay, and he'll distract you for that. He will bring all sorts of things. He will bring financial, you know, I have to work. He'll bring ambition, over ambition. He will bring sin. He will bring all sorts of things he can throw at you. He will throw at you. Why? Because he wants to choke the word. He wants you to get so caught up in the cares of this life that he chokes it. And I have, I have a, a solution you can try, it worked for me, is take your days off. Take a day off every now and again to sit in the presence of God and refocus. Refocus, all right? It's very important for you to refocus. Um, another very important one is speaking in tongues. I am telling you, the power in speaking in tongues, I have not seen anything else anything else at all. So that is, that's why it's so important and we emphasize this so much is to be filled with the Holy Spirit to receive the gifts of the Spirit like speaking in tongues. Why do we need that? Because when you speak in tongues, all right, you are communicating in an unknown language that bypasses all the distractions of this world. Right? That bypasses everything that the devil is throwing at you. Everyone is saying this and this one is saying that and this and that and everything. When you speak in tongues, it's from your spirit to God. Nothing in between. Nothing can get in the way. All right? It's a secret line between you and God. So that's why it's so important to pray in tongues. So I'm going to come to the end here. Um, and, you know, Mark 4.20 says, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30 fold, some 60, and some 100. What's really amazing about that is that 34 means 30 times. The minimum, the minimum growth you will get is 30 times what you sow. Are you listening to me? The minimum growth you will get is 30 times what you sow. All right, so I put those 101 scriptures. I'm waiting for like, what, 30, 100? What's that, 3,000? I'm waiting for that growth. All right? Minimum is that much. But there are some people who aim for 60-fold. That's even better. Some people aim for 100-fold. I'm going to go for 100-fold, right? But there are a few things, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to close with a few things. The first is 
The word of God is evidenced, enduring, and incorruptible. It will never, ever, ever change. All right? It will never not work. To apply the word and see fruit, we need to understand, meditate, and persevere. Can we say that? Understand, meditate, persevere. Can we say that again? Understand, meditate, persevere. All right? This is at the heart. This is the greatest story within the greatest story ever told. This is the meaning of it. All right? Understand, meditate, persevere. The word only works in the life of a believer. I don't know how many of you here, if there is anyone here who has not yet given their life to Christ. Um, it won't work for you. And I'll tell you why. The Bible says one person sows, another person waters, but God gives the increase. Unless you're connected to God, that increase you will not get. You may get it, you know, you know, that's why, you know, 30-fold increase. I'm talking about increase here. Some people come to church, they hear the word once, they're not Christians, they're prayed for, they get healed, they go home, amazing. Ten years later, the thing's back. Why? Because there was no increase. It was just a short period of time. It was just one tree that gave one apple, and that's it. And they're with that apple, and how long can you keep an apple on a tree? It's going to fall off. You need to increase. That only happens when you're connected to Jesus. So, that won't work. The next thing is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is essential for an effective and powerful result. Okay? Speak in tongues. Like I said, every single one you see, every single one of the points you made, it just gets easier when the Holy Spirit is there. All right? If you are not going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can do it. You will see it. All right? But you, it will take longer. It won't be as effective. Why? Because, again, we went through... You know, we went through what the Holy Spirit does, the role of the Holy Spirit. So it's like the difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, in, you know, just accepting Jesus is, is drinking water from a cup and jumping into a river and trying to drink water there. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we're at the end now. And um, here's Crystal to come up and give us some notes, um, you know. And uh, I'm going to ask, um, I'm first going to ask people, so I'm going I'm to go through all, right, I'm going to go through all the three types of people here today that I want people to stand, all right, there's three groups of people. Um, by the end of it, I'm pretty sure almost everyone will be standing, if you're not standing, then I don't know, but first, <laughs> first group of people are people who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. The second group of people are people who have received Jesus, but have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues. That's the second group of people. And the third group of people are people who are standing currently on a seed. You have a seed, all right? You've not planted it yet, but you have that seed, all right? Though that is the third group of people. So if you are in any one of these groups, all right, I'd ask you to please stand. If you have a seed in your hand that you're getting ready to plant, if you're not a Christian, and if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues, please do stand. Praise God. So, um, I'm going to first pray, and you can all pray this together with me. This first prayer is going to be to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. It's a very, very simple prayer. You have to admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus came and died for you, and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you shall be saved. A, B, C. Very simple. So I'm going to go through it. Then I'm going to ask you to come up in front, and anyone who has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the word says, by the laying on of hands, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to do that as well. Come up. Tony's going to pray. I'll join her later on. If someone else has another issue, another seed that they're not too sure of, that they want confirmation about, come up for that as well. We'll pray, all right? So, I'm just going to pray first for people who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I'd like you to repeat after me slowly, everyone in the room, just to help those who, you know, probably have not done it before. So, Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you are good. I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that you are Lord. And I confess that you are Lord of my life. In 
Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you were saved. Congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. It's that simple. If you have prayed that prayer, speak to me, speak to Tony, speak to someone you saw up in the front. Tell us, please, please let us know. Um, but now we're just going to pray in general. I'm just going to pray a closing prayer. But if you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or you're standing on seed for something, healing, financial prosperity, whatever it is, I'm sure there's at least one person in here who's standing on seed. There's at least one person in here who wants the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who wants to see that seed in their life. Please come and pray, be prayed for today. All right? So I'm just going to... Uh, we're all just going to close our eyes and feel free to start walking up, you know, when you feel. Um, we're going to be here for a few minutes. Father, we just give you all the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you're working in your people's lives, Lord. That the seeds that have been there in their heart for a long time, Lord, that you are clearing the ground, Father. That you're making it good soil, Lord Jesus. We thank you that it is going to bring not 30, not 60, but 100-fold fruit, Lord, in every person's life. Lord, we're believing for that today, Lord. Lord, we call on you, oh Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you're working in our hearts. That you're working in our lives, Lord, for this seed to grow. And I just would encourage you, if you have a prayer language, pray in your prayer language right now as we declare over our lives the goodness of God that these seeds will bring forth a hundredfold fruit. Oh Lord, we just give you all the glory. I just feel right now so many people, so many seeds that have not been planted or that have been on the wayside or that have been on the rocks or that have been in the thorns are moving to good ground in the name of Jesus. I declare it over your people, Lord. Lord, we declare the seed that will grow a hundredfold fruit father Lord we just thank you Holy Spirit Lord that you are working in people's lives right now Lord that you are changing hearts that you are making us good soil oh Holy Spirit we thank you that every single person in here today Lord will see growth will see a hundredfold increase in the name of Jesus we declare it we believe it we seal it and we say it is done in the name of Jesus amen hallelujah Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Um, amen. So we're going to stand up here in the front for a few more minutes. Um, but tea and coffee in the back, I think. And uh, feel free to greet someone next to you. Someone you've not met before. Why don't you just go up and say hi? You know? And uh, yeah. Class dismissed. <laughs> So we're open for prayer, such an anointing up here. I'm just asking you to please come up. Don't miss this moment.